Good evening, everybody. We're all, I'm glad you're all here. It's, like, it's been an exciting day for everybody, right? Yeah. Or just another day? Turn with me to Ephesians 4. We're going to look at 4 through 6. There's one body, one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Lord, we thank you for everything. We just thank you that we can join together, that we can fellowship, partake of your word together, enjoy our time as we uh, partake of the word. We thank you for everything. We thank you that you are God. And Lord, we thank you for your word that's so sure and founded on that which is eternal. We ask tonight that you make it real to us, that you anoint the message, anoint your vessel, and we just give you all the praise and thanks. In the name of Jesus, amen. You know, we've been considering how God established the many-member body, the church. Uh, we have to remember it's the mystery. It was a mystery until uh, God revealed that it was in relationship to Christ having the relationship with his church the same as marriage relationship. Now, this church is to ensure that it would become the body it was ordained to be. He has established it in every way possible so we become the body we're called to be. There's not going to be any excuse. By the way, church means assembly called out. It doesn't mean a church building. It doesn't mean some people. It doesn't mean entertainment. It means the assembly called out. You need to take that very seriously, what it really means. Now, we're called out of what? The world. We're called out of the world is what we're called out to live in light of the next age. If you're not separate from the world, you're not going to be distinct from it. You're not going to bring that impression, be that light, be that salt the Bible tells us to be. And basically, I hate to say it, I think the church is missing it in America for the most part. It hasn't come out to be separate. In fact, the world has invaded the church. And you can't tell much difference between the two. Now, as pointed out, there's only one body, not many little groups divided by elitism, which often is denomination, prejudices, which is often created by doctrines, practices that are often involved with rituals and beliefs, which come down to traditions a lot of times. The church is not divided. This one body is universal and can be found in various local bodies of Christian uh, believers throughout the world. No one, no one denomination has a corner on anything. No one church local has a corner on anything. And yet so many times you see these people in their little cliques thinking we have it you're an outsider. We're not even going to give you the time of day. The last thing we should do is see in the church is that type of indifference because it points to love. And the Bible very well clearly says, states that Jesus is going to know we are his disciples because we have love for one another. There should be no division. Is one body because it's united by one spirit, the same spirit people. We should have agreement, one breath. We're breathing the same breath of God, one heart. We should have that one heart that God has in one commission. We don't have all these confusing conflicts that man brings into the equation, and then he wonders why we're not effective. This body lives in expectation of one blessed hope. And that's Jesus coming for his body, his bride. That is what we live in light of. If you're not living in light of the next world of blessed hope, then I can pretty well tell you that your Christianity is pretty nominal. At best, you might be a churchgoer. 
You may pay some tithe here and there, but you're not going to have that commitment, that devotion, or that vision. Our vision should be heavenward. And without vision, people perish. And where's your vision? Is it on this world, or is it heavenward? Uh, is it on what you can get out of this world, or is it on what you can do for God before uh, you're taken out of this world? Now keep in mind, we start out with Jesus as Savior, but we need to graduate people and make him Lord of our lives. We've got to graduate to that. We confess him to be Lord, not Savior. We believe him to be Savior, but we must confess him to be Lord. Because he's the one that we are to serve. He needs to be Lord of our lives so we can come to a place of what? Knowing what is really important to him. And when you finally come to the place of knowing what's important to him, it's because you finally have entered into a friendship with him. Where he can trust you with deep things. Now, through this graduation, and I call it graduation, these graduations, I should say, we're making ourselves ready for what? Think about that. To be ushered into the marriage supper of the Lamb as part of his bride. That's what we should be preparing for. Who will be without spot and wrinkle? A prepared bride. Now, there's two fires that God uses to prepare us, the Holy Spirit and persecution. Now, in America, we have been very uh, fortunate not to, to have the fire of persecution, but people... I hate to tell you, the fire of the Holy Spirit is missing too. And so many things. And so we don't see the passion, we don't see the devotion, we don't see the commitment. Because guess what? We don't have to have it. As long as we can get by, we don't have any ruffles in our little river. And yeah, we can have some here and there, family dynamics, whatever. But what about persecution? What if you're facing death for your faith? Uh, where would uh, a person find you? Standing? are hiding are you prepared to stand are you prepared to die I hate to tell you if you're not prepared to live for Christ don't get the idea you're prepared to die for him either because it takes a lot of self-denial sometimes of yourself to live for Christ in that way now we have to remember that as the Lord he owns us and we, he, he must be the one we please when it comes to service before him remember we have been bought with a price, and that price is called redemption. Now, through this redemption, we have been established in an everlasting covenant in which we lay claim to all that he has for us, all the promises attached to this what? This one faith. Actually, the promises point to adoption, inheritance, but it also brings us to the fact that it's with one faith we obtain or possess this inheritance. One faith. Now, this one faith rests on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. I want you to keep that in mind. Because whenever you take an adventure, and faith does take you on an adventure, by the way. Sometimes it's pretty dark valleys. Sometimes it's mountains of revelation. It's taking you a bit to get there. But it's always going to lead you to one point in your discoveries, Jesus. Whether it's a greater revelation or a greater dependency on him, it's always going to bring you there. Faith's going to lead you there. If faith leads you any other place, you've got a wrong faith, and it's leading you to destruction. By the way, we walk by the word of God. Not what we feel, not what we think, not what we experience, but by the word of God. There is one, only one baptism where the Holy Spirit baptizes us into one body to drink into the same source of water, which again is the Holy Spirit. There's only one God by nature, and there's only one fa Heavenly Father who wants to bestow His incredible love on us along with His many gifts. He wants to do that for us. Now this God is above all. This Father holds all authority. He holds all authority. And it's through, it's through all his power that he's able to make everything available to us. You know, if he didn't have the power, he couldn't promise anything to us. But he has that power. He's Almighty God. And he's able to give us, to uh, pass on, to 
bring us into that place with him that he desires. Now, there's no division in this body. There's, there is agreement in the heavenlies with it as, is, as to its calling and harmony in which it walks in accordance to spirit and truth. If you're walking in the same spirit and truth as the Bible talks about, there will be harmony in your life. There will be agreement in your life with other like-minded Christians who have the same spirit, the same foundation, the same truth. When you don't, when you encounter somebody, I'm not talking about agreement with everything. You're not going to agree with them. But you're going to have that agreement in spirit. You're going to have that agreement on the basis of who Jesus is. That harmony is going to be there. And if you're wise, you're not going to go to those silly, petty little debates that we get into. You can fellowship with that person. Now this brings us to an important reminder and that is, when you look at this, I want you to look at in verse 7. It says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That is Ephesians 2, 7. I want you to think about what he's saying here. There's a measure to the grace he's going to give you. Now remember, grace is eternal, it's, on, it's ongoing, it's ever-flowing, but there's a measure that you're going to receive of his grace. What is that measure? How does God determine the measure of grace he gives us? I want you to think about that for a minute. We just skip over that, oh, you know, we have this lovely fantasy about Christianity. Oh, grace, love, all that just eternal overflowing he gives you a measure of grace and guess what he also gives you a measure of faith think about both of those because does our measure of faith determine how much we're, re we're willing or able to receive his grace he can't give you more than you're able to receive so how enlarged are you in your life, in your faith, to receive greater measure of grace? I often think about these things because I just don't brush over what Scripture says. I say, I say to myself, what does that mean for me, that measure of grace? Because he's eternal and so is his grace. It's ever flowing, but he still gives us that measure of grace. I think you're going to realize that that measure of grace is often experienced in a couple ways. Your, your, first of all, your faith. How enlarges your faith? But second of all, the gift he gives you. Is he able to give you the gift you need, which would be a measure of his grace in your life, because you are trustworthy with that gift, because you will walk in that gift, out that gift in your life. He's going to give it according to the gifts. He's going to give it according to your faith. That measure of grace. So how great is your faith? We always say, oh, I believe in God. He says, okay, I'm going to test you to show you how great your faith is. In your first initial testing, you're going to fail it because guess what? You don't have that faith to get you the next step until you pull yourself back and say, I choose to trust God no matter what I see. And that's when he gives you that measure of faith because you choose the way of faith to take that step. He enlarges your faith even each time you take that step. But how does he enlarge any measure of grace? Each time you assimilate faith, each time you execute that gift he's given through ministry, he will probably give you more. If you're not uh, faithful with the least, you're not going to be faithful with the more. So why would he give you more measure of grace if you're not going to walk in it, if you're not going to uh, execute it, whether it's through gifts or through ministry, why would he give you anything? He's not going to. 
He's going to test you up front to see what kind of measure he can give you of that grace or that faith. Now, again, what determines the measure we receive? This grace, our willingness, our preparation, our calling, our level of faith, our faithfulness to be, do right with what's least in our obedience. Remember, grace reigns through righteousness. Grace reigns through righteousness. So the Holy Spirit has given us gifts to what? To edify the church. We read about them in Romans 12, 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. He's given us gifts. Now we're all one in Christ, but we differ when it comes to callings and giftings. And this is where we really get in trouble because we get envious of other people's callings and other people's giftings. We don't even consider our calling or our gifting. A lot of times we miss it. Excuse me. A lot of times we miss our high calling because we're envious of somebody else's. Sometimes we miss our gifts because we value this gift more than the ones he wants to give us. You'll miss it every time. If you're not willing to say, here I am, God, use me however, give me whatever it takes for me to finish this course, you're probably going to miss some things in your walk. I know I have. Because I wasn't willing, I wasn't open, I wasn't obedient, I wasn't uh, willing to give up that point of myself that I want to hold on to at that point. Remember that you have been, whatever, whoever's entrusted with much will be required much. So we are walking around saying, oh, I want these great things for you, God. Well, if he gives them to you, can you be entrusted with them? Because the problem is, if you can, he's going to judge you with it. He's going to judge you with it down the line. If you're not faithful in small ways, you will not be entrusted with more. And Luke 16.10 tells us that, that he that is faithful in that which he is least is faithful also much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So are you faithful? Are you trustworthy? Are you ready to really do what God wants you to do. Not what you're willing to do, not what you'd like to do, but what God wants you to do. Now let's look at verse 8 in chapter 4. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now we know that his ascending on high was heaven, okay? We also know that the Holy Spirit came to give us gifts. He came to lead those who were captive out of captivity and give us the means in which we could be free. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Even this man, Jesus, was lifted up on the cross. Think about that. That's a pretty... He says, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So Jesus, who can't gave up the glories of heaven, had to ascend on a cross to pay our price for redemption. That's in his humanity. Now, I've looked at these scriptures more than once and tried to figure out, I have a sense of what they mean, okay? We know that he ascended so that the Holy Spirit was sent to do greater works in and through us. That's John 16, 7. And wherever the Spirit of God is, there is liberty, according to uh, 2 Corinthians three seventeen. But there is another way in which liberty is secured. And that is also the preaching of the word. 
the word, the truth sets people free. That is if they believe it, if they walk in it, they walk it out. Now we're told in Luke 4, 18, that Jesus came to set the captives free, and then in 19, he speaks of preaching the acceptable year of the Lord, which was Jubilee. That's where every, every, every enslaved Jew was set free, and all their inheritance was returned to them. He came to bring Jubilee to you and I, to preach to us who were captives. Do you realize you were a captive when you were born? You were a captive to sin. You were captured by death if something did not step on the scene for you. We were captive. And Jesus came to preach to us, but he also ascended so we could receive gifts to be able to help others be set free as well. Now, this is what Psalm says in 68, 68, 18. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among us. That's Psalms 68, 18. He came to set us free, people. The question is, has he set you free? Have you believed his word? Did you realize you were captive to so many things? But you have to remember, before there's to be an ascension, there had to be some type of dissension, some kind of descent that happened. Jesus descended from the heights of glory and became lower than his angels. He was clothed in weak humanity so he could die as the Lamb of God. We're talking about God here. We're talking about Jesus in all of his glory. You can read about his glory. Isaiah chapter 6 talks about his glory in a sense. He had to give all that up and descend and become lower than his creation so he could die for us. Now, we have no clue what he had to give up. We know he gave the same things up, but we have no clue the cost. Now, let me ask you something. Do you think you're going to get anywhere when you're ascending? Do you realize from the time you're born, man is born, he's always trying to ascend? He's trying to be the big shot. The accomplished person, the person that comes out in to on top of his class, his business, whatever, we're always ascending. What are we ascending on? It's called pride. We're always ascending to these places to come out on top, to get our way, whatever we happen to do. But I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says, for those who ascend out of pride, a big fall is waiting you. Because to accomplish anything, you must, above all else, descend. And that's how Christianity works. Jesus told the people, he says, you know, the Gentiles, it's all about rank and honor. But for me... If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, be a servant of all. It's descending, but it's totally contrary to our fallen nature. Think about where Adam fell from. He was actually created in an ascended position of innocence. He was in the garden with God. But look how far he fell. He descended into the greatest depths of all. And you know what's that? He took all creation with him. So what does it mean? Here Jesus, he gave up, it came from the heights of glory, became lower than the angel because he was clothed in that weak humanity. We're all clothed in weak humanity. 
he became a sacrifice that was lifted up as an offering. But then he was taken down again. Oh, he's descended again and put in a grave. You see, that descent didn't stop with the grave alone. He descended into the lower parts of the earth. I want you to think about that. Look at verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Put on the cross, brought down to the grave, and went in even to the lower parts of the earth. Do we even imagine what that's like for him? He went to the lower, lowest parts of hell. Now I'm going to be talking about his ascension and dissension more next week. But I want you to know, there will be no excuse. Because you know why? He came to preach to the captives about his redemption. We are told he went to the lower parts of hell and preached to the captives before the flood. Why? Because everybody's going to know that he was the solution and they still do not believe. Everything from Adam's fall pointed to Christ. Right now, everything points backwards to him. If you don't get him before, after, whatever, if you don't believe there is that promised seed that points to him. If they didn't believe there was a promise seed that he was coming and that he was coming for those who proved to believe. If they didn't believe that, they were judged. If we don't believe that he did come, that he did secure redemption for us, we stand doomed. There's not going to be any excuse on Judgment Day. I want you to think about that. That's major. So why did he have to descend? Why? Why did he have to descend so far? Well, you have to remember, the lower you descend determines the height in which you ascend. That's true for us. The lower we descend in the state of humility, the higher our ascent. Ascension will be in the kingdom of God. You need to keep that in mind. So why did Jesus go to such great lengths, descend in the lower parts, preach to these captives, okay? Why did he do that? I want you to look at that in verse 10. He that descended is the same that also ascended up far above all heavens. He's ascended far above all heavens. This is the bigger. This is the clincher. That he might fill all things. What's he talking about? Fill all things. They say in the, when, G, when the kingdom is set up, the knowledge of the Lord will fill every area. But guess what? The knowledge of redemption fills every area too. You may not want to hear it, you may reject it, but that knowledge, that preaching, is all about his redemption. It's all about salvation. It's all about deliverance. It's all about reconciliation. And it fills the whole world if we care to hear it. It's in the stars. It's in the Bible. It's in every believer that goes around and says, Jesus is real. It should be behind every pulpit. It should be a witness of every Christian. Jesus is alive. He died for you. He died in the place of your sin. Do you not think for one minute that message doesn't fill everything in so many ways? The cross, the songs, even some of the rituals points to this reality of Jesus Christ. You know what? In the end, there's not going to be an excuse. Those captives before hell, before the flood, 
those afterwards. There's not going to be an excuse because the reality of God, the reality of his redemption has filled everything. There's not going to be anything. Christ came, became all in all to us. Now, he's talking about what we're going to be looking at now is how he established it. Look in verse 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. These are positions that he has established. I really have a problem today because it seems like people say, I don't need to do what the Bible says. We don't need these positions. We don't need a pastor. We'll just have elders and throw some sucker out there that preach the word. He, he appointed people to be pastors. Yes, there's elders, and the pastor can be an elder. But there's supposed to be a head there, just as he is a head of the body. There has to be someone that people can go to, someone that can be held accountable for what's going on in the church. So I'll throw the pastor out and we'll just have elders. You have just gone against the word of God. If he's a pastor, then that's what he is. If he's not, then you should have a pastor. Quit trying to minimize what God has established. He has a reason why he established the way he did. And I get really disgusted with churches. It's like it's a new thing. No, it's a rebellious thing. Do what the Bible says. If a man's a pastor, then that's what he's called to be, a pastor. That's the position he's supposed to fill. And he's responsible to do it right. If you have all these people that are going back and forth, who are you going to call for accountability to when the sheep aren't being fed properly? Who are you going to hold responsible? Oh, that elder over there, how about that elder? Well, I only teach on this time. Oh, I only share on this time. Doesn't work that way. You can't have order that way. That's why I get a little disgusted with churches. Let's go back to what the Word of God says and trust what God has established in, for his church. And so he says there's five positions. There's apostles. What's an apostle? Well, it's not like the first apostles. The first apostles and prophets laid the foundation. The apostle means sent one. I often think of them as missionaries. Apostles' main responsibility, please hear me, is to establish a local church, a local body. They go in there, they lay the foundation that has been established by the apostles and prophets. They line people up to the cornerstone. They find leaders that can step into those places to keep that church going. Sometimes the apostle, a position of the apostle, uh, ceases to be. They may become something else in the church, or they may be sent elsewhere to start a local body. But that's what apostle does. I knew a person that was an apostle. They started churches, but they went on to try to be a pastor, and that's the last thing they should have been. They didn't have a heart of, of a pastor. They were more evangelistic if they were going to do anything else. You can't afford to have people in the wrong place. That's why you've got to establish if that's their calling or not. Is this really your calling? Or is this something you want to do? I have seen a lot of pastors who, that's something they want to do. In fact, one of the biggest things I hear sometimes with pastors who are hardly shepherds is that, well, it's a good way to make money. How many of you know that Finney was going to be, a go into being a pastor because he was a lazy person? Figure that was easy money. If I remember, he's the right one. And so he went to be a preacher because... Oh, was it George Mueller? Sorry, it's George Mueller. There's more than one that, oh, well, I can just go in. I'm a con. I can get money out of people. Well, God got a hold of George Mueller, and that's a different story. But there's always those people. Well, I know George, uh, I know Finney had a, a, a fight with God over what he was going to do, a lawyer being an evangelist. Yeah. 
He fought with God over that, and God won. Praise God. He was one of the great revivalists of the 1800s. But you have to realize that if he has called you to something, then that's the position you need to be in. But if he hasn't called you to that, then don't be there and don't give other titles or other uh, whatever to that position. I could get on that for a long time, as you can see, because I've heard so much. So apostles really establish a local body. They make sure it's founded on the foundation of Christ, lining up to his cornerstone, and that's what they're supposed to do. So a lot of times missionaries do the work of apostles because they start local bodies. What is a prophet nowadays? Prophet is, is an interesting position because you may have a prophet sitting by you, you'll never know it until God tells him to speak. Sometimes he will bring a person in from outside of a church with a message for the pastor or for the church. I can tell you right now it's a very unpopular position. It is not something people like. Because when God sends a prophet in, it's usually because he's about ready to spank. The church isn't right, so he warns. He, he sends people in that have the courage to get up, be a vessel, and get ready to be persecuted. They'll come in with a message from God, and it might not be a very pleasant one. So they're not very much like. It could be that person sitting next to you. It could be some strange woman that walks in, doesn't really look right, and she opens her mouth, and she spills out all kinds of rebukes and warnings. You never know. But what I'm here to tell you is the prophet is to contend for the well-being of that body. And whatever it takes, he will contend for the soul, the heart of the church on behalf of God. So what's an evangelist? And a lot of times when people look at an evangelist, they think, oh, they come in to save those lost sinners. This is to the church not to lost sinners. I want you to note that evangelists are for the church, not lost sinners. I'm going to really stress that tonight as never before. What evangelist does is evangelist comes to do what? To revive the body. Because the body's asleep. It's a comatose or it's dead. A body that is dead is a body that's lost its vision. It's lost its calling. It's lost its heart for the lost, especially. The evangelist comes in and he shakes the church. He wakes them up. Now what happens sometimes is he has to go in there. He has to be tough because you know why? Some of the very leaders need to be born again, and they think they are. They've had enough religion. If you study, I just love uh, Charles Finney. If you study his stuff, it's incredible. I mean, he went in there one time, and he had this, he was a deacon of the church, giving him a bad time, I think it was, and, and he says, you need to be born again, basically is what came down. And that that leader, I think he was even higher than a deacon, deacon was having a, a real fit, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit grabbed that guy, and he was in a wrestling match of his life. He was bowed on the floor all night long. He got up and, got, and was saved. People in your own churches, in your own leadership, need to be born again. And the evangelist comes in, and he shakes, and he whatever... As Jeanette says, Jeanette said that one evangelist basically got them so caught up with what was going on that he lost his teeth. That's the way it works sometimes. The evangelist has to get a hold of the church 
It has to be revived. And sometimes it goes out in the community and people are saved. But you know what? Until the church is revived, it cannot disciple and it cannot take care of unsaved uh, people who get saved. We don't see evangelists anymore. They're really not there. They're not there. And why? It's because I've talked to a couple of evangelists. They say the pastor expects me to come in and entertain them. And it doesn't matter how, but to get people up in front whether they're getting saved or not. That's what it's all about, performance. I thought, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. Count that pastor trusts the Holy Spirit to do. Let that evangelist teach that or preach that message. And I'm going to tell you something about evangelists. They will deal with sin in your church. They will deal with the culture in your church that's become very worldly. They will deal with it. They'll call it out. They're not always popular. You see, a lot of the pastors want them, the, the evangelists make them look good. Oh, look at your pastor. What a wonderful guy you've got here. That's not what an evangelist is for. The church is greatly suffering because they don't have evangelists. Challenging them with the truth. Now you have to realize the first three positions are not permanent within the local body. The evangelist does not have the same body he doesn't do that. He has to oftentimes go from church to church wherever he's told to go by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the prophet isn't always going to be in that position of prophet until, the God, until God raises up and calls them to go give this message. An apostle does travel. But these next two positions are permanent within the body. And that is preacher and teacher. That's why I'm having a fit about the, uh, what they're doing with the position of preachers today. They're just turning them into these elders. No, you need a preacher. You need a pastor. You need someone with a shepherd's heart. You need someone who's going to invest in the sheep. They're not there for themselves. They're there for the sheep. You need that figurehead. Now, a pastor has a shepherd's heart. It's that simple. He's there to feed the sheep. He's there to nurture the sheep. He's there to uh, care for the sheep, as Jesus would for his church. He's there as a representation of Jesus. He has to have the heart of the shepherd. He has to be willing to fight wolves on behalf of his sheep. He has to be willing to stand and deal with heretics or charlatans or discern and test the people that he exposes his sheep to. He has to be on top of it. That's what a shepherd's supposed to do. He has uh, the rod, the word of God in one hand, the staff of the Holy Spirit he's supposed to be relying on. He's supposed to have love for the sheep. I have to admit, I've not seen very many shepherds that love their sheep. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen shepherds that really care what's happening for, with their sheep. I haven't seen a lot of shepherds that feed their sheep, lead them be t beside still waters and the word of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit. I don't see that anymore. I see it as a big business for, for a lot of these pastors. It's big business, good uh, retirement funds, uh, mansions, whatever, but it's not about feeding the sheep. It's oftentimes about fleecing the sheep. God is going to judge them mightily. I would not want to be in their shoes. The damnation will be so great if they abuse his sheep. Now, that's what they're there to do. Sometimes those shepherds aren't the greatest preachers in the world. 
I have to admit that to you. Sometimes they're really sort of boring preachers, but they have such a love for you. Uh, sometimes they're good teachers, and sometimes they're not. But they have a love for the sheep, and they give their life up for the sheep. That's how committed they are. You don't see that very much. I read about pastors like that. They were back there in the beginning of the 1900s and late 1800s. And, but I don't read about them much today. So here we have teachers next. Teachers are to challenge your mind. But to challenge that part of your mind that gets you to move past your worldly understanding to seek a greater revelation of Jesus Christ. The teacher doesn't want you to ever remain in a stagnant position. They want you to even pass them in your knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. They're going to get you to fall in love with the Word of God as much as they can. They're going to get you to be enthusiastic about the Word of God. They're going to always point you to the Word of God. In a lot of ways, teachers will disciple you. So that you can know God. My question is that since God has put these positions in the word, why don't we stick with it? Why don't we practice it? Why don't we encourage it? Pastors need to discern the spirits. Congre congregations need to test their creeds. We need to take responsibility to make sure the right person's in that position. I learned a long time ago that the church gets the pastor they want and the pastor gets the church he's looking for. So if the church doesn't demand the shepherd to be the best type of shepherd, just someone that will be the position of a shepherd, they'll find them easily enough. And then the shepherd's looking for a good congregation. I can't tell you how many shepherds have walked away because congregations have not had that love, that commitment to see God's word go forth and encourage their pastor. We're in bad shape. And the more you study the word of God, you will realize the church in America is in bad shape. It is not doing what God has ordained and set up and constructed right here in the Word of God. It is as black and white as you can get it. And yet, we do not believe. The Lord set up this leadership in His body so that it would be established, empowered, and successful in the edification of the complete body. That's why he set it up. If the body is being enslaved by tyrants, conned by charlatans, led astray by heretics, and played by hypocrites, the love will be missing and the fruit crummy. You know, it's time to let Christ outshine those who did not die for you. Doesn't matter who they are. It is time to let Christ outshine those who did not die for you. He's the only one who calls you to follow him to a challenging but glorious life. People, you can't go any further than the one you're following. And if you're following yourself, Guess how far you're going to go. If you're following a, a false shepherd, guess how far you're going to go. Make sure you're following Jesus Christ.